Hey everybody, welcome back to Maker's Acres. I'm Bobby, and I want to take just a moment to talk to you guys as subscribers. I wanted to thank you all very much and all my new subscribers for joining the channel. It really helps grow the channel, it really shows me that you guys like and want more of this content. If you're new to the channel, I try to post every week, and I'm sorry I have not posted in the last few months. I got sick and then I got really busy at work, and I'm now hopefully caught up. This video is six months in the making and hundreds of hours of editing, so it took me a really long time to chew through this content. If you guys have any comments about what you think will make this better or what you like or what you dislike, please let me know in the comments below. I'll try to incorporate that in future videos. With that being said, I just want to say thanks again for watching, and let's check this out. Help fix the, uh, this for my buddy and his scissor lift. Repaired the chip on here. Not sure if it was right because there was no markings on the chip, so we took our best guess as to what it could be, but we did find a chip that had exploded. Gave this back to him a few months ago to put it back in here, and he finally got around to it and opened it up, and uh, he wasn't the one who took it apart. Actually, JLG sent a technician out, and he kind of really screwed this whole thing up. He took this for several months, said he sent it in for repair. It turns out he didn't do anything, uh, and then it took like months to get it back. Finally got it back. Me and my buddies tried repairing it, and so unfortunately, I didn't pull this apart, so I don't know how it looked or, or how it started, but I'm gonna try to put it back together. I've got some manuals of what goes to what, and I'm gonna get this back in there and see if we can get it to power up and do something. So I've got everything kind of like temporarily connected and I just want to test it because we're not sure if what we did to the control board actually fixed it. I've got two things going on. I've got one, I don't know where these go, and two, I don't know if the board works. So I'm going to try connecting this. Now the E stops on, so I'm going to pop that, and there's probably one up here that's popped. It showed me the tilt sensor. Battery indicator starts up. That's good. I see a little red indicator light there. A red indicator light. So this contactor is supposed to engage and the pump's supposed to come on, but that probably only happens when it runs. The machine's tilt sensor was throwing an error, and since I wasn't familiar with this machine, I decided to go ahead and level it out anyways just to make sure that wasn't causing anything from engaging. Unfortunately, that wasn't the problem. It still wasn't engaging the contactor, so I decided to move on and test the contactor. The contactor seemed to work well, so it was time to take a closer look at the control board. And I want to warn all of you right now, I am not an electronics expert, so some of my terminology might slash probably will be wrong. All right, so we did some checking and some tracing, and something that seems kind of good is we replaced this component right here. And this was a challenge because it, like most of the things on this board, it's unlabeled to protect people from copying it, but uh, we took a guess. This one seems to be right. This one is providing 24 volts on the DC rail. I guess before that wasn't working. We do have voltage on the rail. I do see buttons respond. However, the motor is not kicking on. So just pulled it apart, tried to do some troubleshooting, figure out that the contact is pin 11 here, which connects to, in uh, I think this is JP, JP2, pin 11, as actually closes the contact closure. We're tracing it back. It goes through a diode up here, and then it goes into this FET, which we checked and that doesn't seem to be shorted out, so that's good. And then it runs, I believe, through this capacitor, this blue capacitor down here, and then to a pin on this microchip. That seemed to all tone and test fine, but I mean, we didn't see any shorts and we saw no signal coming out the way that it was supposed to be acting. So uh, with that being said, uh, I think that's about as much troubleshooting I can do without really, you know, manual applying five volts to this and seeing if it will pull down to ground. But for the time being, I'm going to think that this is okay and we're going to put this all back in the unit. Hopefully we'll get somewhere. All right, well, I'm going to have faith 
that uh, now that I've probed the board and understand how it works and what needs to be connected to what, I'm going to have faith that this is going to work again. So I'm going to clean all this up permanently and label and mark things off that aren't going to be used. So it's, you know, the next person who services this, it'll be easier. Uh, so maybe labeling a heat shrink. So let's, let's dig into that mess. This isn't the way this is supposed to be wired in here. That's not supposed to be wired directly to the battery. That's supposed to be wired to the B minus on the computer board. And this is supposed to be wired to an inline fuse on the contactor so it doesn't run the beacon all the time. Um, I'm just gonna unscrew it because in this configuration, uh, it's running on less voltage. So I don't know why it's only running on six volts. So I don't know why it would ever ever correctly run like that. I'm gonna take that off of there and connect a power supply to it and just see that it's running okay. Hey, look at that. That's awesome. All right, so yesterday I had a couple interesting discoveries. One is that I found that the previous person that disassembled this mislabeled one of the wires, and so I traced everything out. When I was probing the board with the meter, it looked like everything should work, so it seemed like something else was cutting off power to this. And just to recap, the component we placed on the board, we determined was a 24 volt rail. Once I checked the 24 volt rail, it looks like that's all powering up. So I think we actually did solve the component level problem on the board. The other day when I got it all together, it acted like all the buttons were working, but it wouldn't start the motor, wouldn't turn over the contactor. And when I wired the contactor directly to the battery, or I kind of bypassed the ground, like I pulled it down to ground, it detected that there was a miswiring. So there's a little bit of smarts. Uh, surprisingly for the board. I don't think we did any damage to the board, luckily, because it had uh, has diodes and circuit level protection. And it looks like when I checked the FET on the board, looks like it was still good. Luckily, my friend got on FaceTime, helped me try to troubleshoot some of that. So uh, I think that's good. So yesterday afternoon, after I found that discovery where the component was connected or mislabeled correctly, I started really labeling everything really good with a labeler and did traced a bunch of stuff back so I know where everything goes. Now I understand a lot more about this unit and how it functions and why it does what it does. And also this has a pivoting mechanism. I'm gonna take this whole thing off and try to get back there and into the bushings where this slides back and forth because it was almost impossible with two people to open it. But it looks like that's a little harder to do. It looks like you have to remove um, some blocks in there. It just, it looked like it was gonna turn into a real can of worm. Instead of that, I sprayed W. 40 into all the bushings and now I could move this back and forth. It wouldn't do that at all before. It was it was really stuck. Two people, like we were both really yanking on it to get it out this far. I think that's helped that quite a bit. You know, this lock is broken. If I have time, I'll take this off and try to bend it back. There's a high likelihood that it's been bent so far that it might just break, but it's not doing anything now. So I don't think I can make it much worse. I'm also gone through, I'm putting heat shrink on things, especially these big battery terminals, you put heat sinks between the cable and part of the, uh, the exposed metal and really get everything but where you're clamping it down uh, protected and sealed. Uh, and that helps for a number of reasons. One is I like it because it looks better. You can see here, but I think it also adds another level of protection in case the uh, boot, which you know in this case the boot is kind of damaged. Most of these boots should be replaced. But it also protects against accidental contact touches when you've got wrenches in here. It just as another level of protection only exposes what needs to be uh, exposed. I think it also adds a little bit of strength between this joint. Uh, helps relieve some stress on that. Uh, not much, but it helps a little bit. That's more noticeable on you know these ring connectors when you put heat shrink over and that kind of really helps strengthen those if you're just crimping them. Now, if it's a permanent job, I like to solder all these crimp connectors because I just don't trust the crimp. In fact, last night, the crimp connector that was on here pulled out. That's when I gave up because I realized I gotta get the soldering iron out. It's late, so might as well do it right. You can see I've got these nice labels on everything, what jumper they connect to, what they belong to, that really helps. And then I also taped up this harness 
and I've got one or two more things I'm going to tape up. And then these ones that aren't used, I'm just going to put heat shrink over them to show that they're not being used because when you disassemble this and you walk back into this situation where you don't know what is and what isn't connected, there are a couple options that aren't installed on this machine that require these connectors, but if you walk into this and don't know and you just see a bunch of wires like I walked into it, you spend a ton of time trying to trace down what that could be, where these could go, and then eventually finding out they don't go anywhere. So uh, some of those ones I've, you know, I've put in wiring harnesses like this and I'll put some heat shrink over those, but you can see I taped all these up and these just aren't used and probably will never be used. There's a power deck extension on this that slides the deck back and forth. That's not something you're gonna retrofit and modify, especially on this used unit. Wouldn't make any sense. It costs you more for that than buying a unit with it already on there. Just gonna heat shrink all those just to kind of tell the next person that these aren't used. Also replace some of these bolts, you know, that were rusted out. They're just quarter 20. I have a whole bunch of grade eight quarter 20s from another project, exact same size. So it's nice to, nice to put those back. Not only did it look better, but when I pulled one of these out, the nut broke because it was corroded so bad. It was hard to get the nut off of there. It just snapped. Pull the alarm out, swap those bolts, put new nuts on top of the alarm, and then I test the alarm. I connected it to the power supply and just made sure that that was still working, and it does. Also manually connected the beacon, and that still runs. And it looks like that runs from a weird range of voltages, from 6 volts to 24. It seems like it runs fine. Like I said, I discovered yesterday that the beacon was wired directly to the battery on one terminal, and then the other side was wired into the fuse up here. So what ends up happening is if you don't make sure you e-stop this thing all the time, what ends up happening is the beacon just continuously runs and drains that battery. And what's worse about that, since it was only connected to one cell, it wasn't connected to the cells in series, but it was only drawing the six volts instead of 24 volts. So it was drawing a higher amperage. It was drawing a couple amps as opposed to less than half an amp when you're at full voltage. It drains the cell and lead acid batteries you're not really supposed to drain them as far as, as possible. You know, it's a bad practice. I think after you drain a lead acid all the way, all the way till they're done, I think they lose something ridiculous, like uh, 20 or 30% of their capacity the first couple of times you drain them to zero. So it's not really good practice to do that. And with it being tied to this battery, he's, he's told me that he's, that it's drained the battery several times and he's come back with the machine dead because someone forgot to e-stop it. And that's only this cell. So it's really done damage and when I, connected a voltmeter to the cell, I saw one volt on the six volt cell. So that cell probably needs to be replaced. There's a couple old cells in here. I had a charger on one of them uh, all night and it only got to like 61%. So I think there's at least one more cell in here that's bad. These should be a little north of six volts. I think this one stopped at about five and a half. This one, I think five and a half. This one, five and a half. This one on the end, I think went to like 6.2 volts. So now that, uh, now that I've got that, I'm gonna solder the, these broken connections. I'm gonna wire the beacon back in correctly the way that it shows on the wiring diagrams. And then I'm gonna use dielectric grease on all these connectors and put them back on there. Get everything as neatly as I can back in place. Let's get started. So this is perhaps the moment of truth. I got everything rewired. I'm about to connect the battery back to it. See what happens. Spoiler alert, after messing with this for about an hour, I was still not able to get the contactor to engage. So there was still something wrong with the control board and it was back to troubleshooting. Just to give you an idea of how I'm trying to troubleshoot this issue right now, is I've disconnected the motor and attached the beacon to use as a dummy load, which is about a half an amp at 24 volts. Then I have attached the scope on the 24 volt rail, which is fed by the chip we replaced, and now I'm going to press the drive button. What you can see here is that the voltage collapses and that this chip is not passing 24 volts, so it's really pointing to this chip that I replaced still being the culprit. So while I dig into that a little more, I'm going to work on some other physical items on this unit until I can figure out what's going on. It's 
So after looking at this, I've got some hydraulic lines that are kind of really beat up here. The exposed braid, you know, it'll probably last for a little while longer, but these are like 20 or 30 bucks a cable. So I'm just going to pull them out and swap them because I'm doing maintenance now. Might as well just try to take care of this, take it down to the local hose shop and get new ones made up. And hopefully they'll, this will keep this lasting a lot longer. So there's at least the motor ones here, these front two motors, uh, drive wheels, and then there's, I think, a couple on the motor I want to replace, too. So let's get these out. All right, since I'm going through this, the next thing I want to look at is this. And kind of on all scissor lifts I've ever seen, there's always been electrical tape on this. It's always been a mess. And I want to take this apart, inspect it, see how it's doing, and then you know, see why they did that, and see if I can at least you know retape it, maybe look, make it look a little nicer. Ideally, if I could get these pins out, I would slide new heat shrink on it, but that's gonna be kind of impossible to do. So let's see what I can do to make it look better at least. After opening this up, I found the wires were all in good shape and the original factory heat shrink was never shrunk, which I did, but unfortunately left way too much exposed wire, so I still had to tape everything back up. Next I wanted to check on the control lever, which for some reason someone covered in masking tape despite the screws being installed correctly. Now they mounted this joystick in the wrong place. You can see there was original holes, and this edge rubs down here so it can't, can't really screw down. So somebody replaced this joystick with the wrong one at some point. Well, I'm going to hit pause here and wrap this video up so it doesn't get super long. Let me know down in the comments below if you like these as relatively short multi-part videos or if you'd rather I post one very long video of this whole process in the future. As always, thanks again for watching and I'll catch you on the next one. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to connect power here. Oh, so you want me to kick you off if something happens? Yeah. I'm the electrocution prevention committee. So for some reason the way it was connected... Sweet Things are getting a little crazy. Things are blown away.